Hello and welcome. I'm here to talk to you today about using your beginning and intermediate high school sight reading to help create independent musicians. If you don't know, my name is Jessica Newcoop and I've had the privilege for the last 13 years to be the director of vocal music at Owasso High School. Now we all know the adage, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. But I love applying this concept to music. Teach your students to sing a song, they can sing it for the concert. Teach your students how to read music, and they can sing anything. Now, you know the benefits of sight reading. I know you do, or you wouldn't be here. But do your students, do your students understand how it creates confidence, how you give them a piece of music, and not only do they know what to do with it, how they're going to learn it, but they know what it's gonna sound like. You get to the part where you're making music faster. I don't think anyone, student, teacher, accompaniment, likes the part where we're just playing through parts. Nobody likes that. If you have better, stronger sight readers, you get straight to the part where you're making music faster. Your students will develop better ears. Not only are they going to be able to hear what's on the page before they have to sing it, they'll be better at listening to each other. They'll be better at listening across the choir, across to the accompaniment. It'll create better listeners. One of the things I absolutely love is there is a direct work benefit relationship. The more they do it, the better they are at it, the better they are at it, the faster they will learn music and they will see that progress and be excited to continue it. Now, one of the big things in creating successful sight readers is integrating a system. Now, we use movable dough, loud based minor, hand signs, ta -ti -ti. It's great, it works for us. There are thousands of different versions that work. If you are a fixed dough person, do it. If you are a count singer, do it. Whatever works for you, pick it, run with it, be consistent with it. Have your students know what they are going to encounter when they encounter a new piece of music. Research has shown that incorporating some form of movement helps the students visualize how the music works. That doesn't mean they need to be doing curl and hand signs. My students do it, it works for them. But if you just have them show, it goes up here, it goes down here. Just that act of moving helps ingrain it into their brain that there's a difference between jumping a third and jumping a fifth. Just having your students move their hands. Be consistent about it. If they know what they're gonna do, if they know what is expected, it'll just happen. Use it in class. I know that there is benefits to saying, here is an MSVMA site reading. We shall now practice this MSVMA site reading because we are going to take it to festival and this is something we have to do for that. It's fine, it works, you'll get your good grade at festival. But is that really teaching what it is that you need them to teach? Use it in class, use it as something more than this is a thing and festival is the end point. Do it regularly. As a site reading adjudicator, it is so obvious when students walk into the room well, these kids just practiced sight reading starting in February because they knew that's when festival's coming. You can see as soon as they walk in, the students who are familiar with how sight reading works, the students who know what the process is going to be, who know exactly what's going to happen before it happens. Use it regularly and then apply it. Apply it to what you're learning in class. Use it to teach songs. Use it for more than MSVMA festival sight reading. Now, I'm a big fan of making sure that you're incorporating interval singing in class. It doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be something that takes up a lot of time. Use it in your warm-ups. Sing scales, sing arpeggios, use your tendency tones, use patterns, and then again, use movements. There's a lot of really great activities. And I'm gonna show you a couple as we go through here. I'm a big fan of Solfege Telephone. I'm a big fan of Choose Your Own Adventure Scales, and we'll go through those, and then again, use movements. So here's a group of my students and we just recorded real fast. This is a scale that we sing every day. You'll notice that they're using hand signs. Some of them are really familiar with the current hand signs and you'll see accurate hand sign movements. Some of them either didn't take choir in middle school, came from a different middle school program, or just weren't able to master the art of the specific hand sign. So you're going to see that they're doing what we call the fist pump. They're still making the movements up and down, but not necessarily using the different hand motion. So here they are. Okay. So just within there, you're going to see that they're singing a scale. They're singing the basic triad, 
and they're singing the tendency tones. Those are things they're going to encounter in almost any song that they're singing and specifically within any sight reading exercise that they run into. They are familiar with them. They know what they sound like. They know what to do when they see them. Oh, there's a song again. There we go. Um, so I'm a big fan of the choose your own adventure scale. Um, we're going to see an example of it, but I'm going to talk you through it. Um, students are going to sing up the scale. We add Ray on the top and then on the way down, they're going to pick a note and they're going to hold it. And it makes a really cool like Whitaker cluster chord. And they're like, oh, we sound so cool. And then they resolve it. It's a great way to help teach tendency tones. T is going to go to do, la is going to go to so, fa is going to go to me, Ray is going to go to do. And then of course, do, me and so are anchor points and they're going to stay there. So again, you're going to see them sing up the scale. We add Ray on the top. On the way down, they're going to hold a chord, hold a note. And then when they get the cue, they will resolve it to do, me, and so. Here it is. So again, you're going to see people that are using accurate hand signs. You're going to see people who are using, again, the fist pump method. Uh, this is great. It teaches tendency tones. It teaches them that when I have a T, it is probably going to go to do somewhere. If I have a fa, it's going to want to pull itself down to me. It teaches their common tendency tones. Provides really great dissonant consonant resolution. All of the things that we are looking at in modern music have some sort of really fun, juicy dissonance. And gives them more familiar with that sound and then that resolution. If self-directed, students who are like, man, I want a challenge, are going to be more likely to teach your notes that are going to resolve. Students who are maybe more cautious about it, you can encourage them to sing do, me, and so, and then they don't have to change. Um, as I said, they love the Whitaker sound. They're like, ooh, look how cool this chord sounds. And if you get a really nice acoustical space, it makes a really cool ring back, and it's great. Make it crazy. Make it, make it easy. Make it whatever makes it works for you. When I do it with my beginning ensembles, we usually have them hold so me or do so that they are used to that triad sound. And then later we can teach them how to add, you know, your four, three suspensions with the fa, me. Um, it's just a great different way to, to have them engage in tendency tones. Solfege telephone is super fun. Um, I have had success with this from middle school students all the way up to my advanced high school students. Um, you need a leader that's going to sing and sign a four beat pattern. It doesn't, again, have to be the real hand signs. You can just have them showing space. It goes up, it goes down here. So they'll sing it to the first group. That group is then going to turn around and sing it to the next group and then turns around to get more information. So you are singing to one group, one group gets it, turns and sings it to the next, turns and sings it to the next. It's kind of like a giant game of telephone. You can do it in groups as large or small as you want. Um, with my beginning ensembles, I usually make long, wide rows so that you might only have two or three rows going, but it does mean that they have, you know, 10 or 12 people in the row together, so they're not singing as much by themselves. My advanced ensembles, we usually turn it around the other way, so you have not as many people per row, but more rows. Uh, it gets really kind of fun and complicated because it takes so long for the music to travel all the way down. Um, a fun thing we add on to it sometimes is rotating the students. So, you know, first row moves to the back, everybody moves down. Um, so that way you get a different part of the students that are receiving the direct information. Um, with my advanced groups, they, my chamber choir especially, loves being able to be the people at the beginning that try to run to the end and get there before the one they just sang gets all the way down. Rotate the leader. Um, at the beginning, I always, always lead it. And I always start with do, do, do. And so they know that that's, that's what's coming first. But if you have students that are ready to start leading, have them, have them do it up in front and lead the class. And it can be so much fun. So I'm going to show you um, kind of what Solfege Telephone looks like. Now, there's three different clips within this. The first one, you're going to see them practicing the rotation. Because if we're being honest, the ability to sing a thing and then turn around and sing it can be challenging. So first you're going to see them sing and turn, then we're going to practice passing it. So you're going to see the first group turn and sing it to the next group, turn and sing it to the next group who sings it to the wall. And then you're going to see them actually pass it. So three different things that are going to happen here. So 
so you'll see they're getting the information and practicing turning around and singing it behind them. Okay, now they're going to practice passing it. So we sang it to each row. Now here's a full version. And this can go as long as you want, and it can get so fun as the tones kind of overlap. You'll find at the beginning we spend a lot of time within the Domi So Triad because it helps the students be able to hear things. And again, you'll see hand movements just helping them place where it needs to go to the people around them. So one of the big things is that making sure that you are applying solfege learning in class. Sight read the music you're already learning. You have new music that they get all the time. I highly doubt your students are singing one song and that's it through the whole year. They're getting new pieces. Use that as an opportunity to sight read. Use an entire piece. My students love when we have an entire piece that we learn by Solfege, where I never have to play any voice parts for them. They only learn it through the sight reading process. We usually put a little asterisk in the concert that say, like in the program that says, this song was entirely learned using our sight reading system. Use an entire piece, use a section of a piece. If it feels overwhelming for you to use an entire piece, use just a chunk of it. Um, have them do it independently, have them do it dependently. It depends on what kind of level of class you have. My beginning ensembles, we always start the process together and we work through it together. By the time my students are in their advanced auditions ensembles, they're able to do it completely independently. I can hand them a new piece and say, hey, we're gonna sight read this and they'll go through the process. Um, I am sure your school is very into the real world application part of education, but the ability to have the students take what they're learning in class and say, why am I learning this? This is why we're learning it, because you have to be able to read music. Don't have festival be the end point. Don't say we are learning this because you have to do it at festival. We are learning this because music is a language and you need to be able to read. Side story, I went to Vienna with my brother a couple years ago. My brother was a dedicated choir and band student all the way through high school, but then didn't really ever do music afterwards. We were walking through one of the museums and there was a really cool old manuscript and he looked at it and he worked with the sight reading skills that he had learned in high school and said, oh, hey, this is Ode to Joy. And I was like, you're right. And I was so excited about it because that's him using his music in a real world application. Um, I tell my students all the time, I don't believe that you're ever gonna be in a life or death sight reading situation, but the ability for you to read music is a skill that you can use your entire life. So using class music with my beginning ensembles, we'll get a new piece and we'll get a section, a section that is easily achievable, easily attainable. Here's a clip from, um, well, what's it called? When you walk through the storm from uh, Carousel. Um, you'll see that it's really easy solfege, it's really easy rhythm, and it's a really easy section to do. So we will go through the festival process, go through the way that sight reading will happen. So we're gonna say, here is our chunk. Let's talk about it. Your key signature is clear. Your time signature is four, four. Let's count it. And we will do the rhythm on do and count through it. We'll go through solfege with my beginning ensembles. We'll do it together. My first note is this, my second note is this, and we'll make sure that we're all writing it through and doing it all together. Then we'll go through it and practice it. Go through the tricky parts. Hey, this is a jump and this could be a little weird. So to Ray, that could be weird. Let's look at it. Let's practice, let's practice that interval. And then we'll work on doing it together. When it gets to more of my intermediate ensembles, they'll do some of those steps on their own. Um, some of my groups, I can just say, hey, the whole center, tenor section, go here, make your circle, go through the solfege together, go through the rhythm together, practice it together, and they can do it, do it in sections. Um, when they're ready, they'll be able to jump into other sections. Uh, my treble ensembles love this. We'll have our three little pods, my sopranos, my middles, and my altos. They all have their own little pod. They all work on sight reading. And when they are ready, they're like, hey, soprano twos are ready to mingle. And my altos will be like, yo, altos are ready too. And they'll go together and they're doing it and they're learning the piece. And I have never played the piano part with them. 
they love it. It may feel like it takes longer. You might be like, man, I can teach these five measures in two seconds. But then how many times are you going to have to go back and say, ooh, elders, let's go through this part again. Ooh, tenors, we're not singing the right note there. It may feel like it takes longer, but the more you do it, the faster it goes. The better they learn it, the better they retain it, the less time you're going to spend in class, blonk, 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 playing notes. Practice the way you perform, perform the way you practice. My high school band director, Dean Christopher, said this to us every day. Do it the way you've been doing it when you get to festival. Don't let it be some new and scary phenomenon. We got to go into the sight reading room and this is a new thing that we've never done. It should be something that they've been doing all the time. You've been showing them in class. You've been showing them when you're getting new pieces of music. Even if it's not the whole piece, you've been showing them chunk by chunk how to do it. And then walk into that sight reading room and the students know that this is what is going to happen. As I said, as a sight reading adjudicator, you can tell as soon as they walk in the room how successful they're going to be. Consistency is the key. Everyone functions and thrives on routine and consistency. If they know a new piece of music, this is how I do it. I'm going to look at the time signature. I'm going to look at the key signature. I'm going to count it. I'm going to look at my solfege. I'm going to sing it to myself. I'm going to do it. It's a skill. Don't make it be a chore. Don't say, okay, and now we shall spend our 10 minutes sight reading because that's what we must do because then it becomes a chore. It doesn't become some cool skill that they know how to do, some cool language that they speak, that they know and can use forever. Now, our sight reading routine is the exact same, as I said, as the routine that we're doing when we are looking at it every time we're getting a new piece in class. Let me just talk you through it. As soon as we get it, we sit in the room, we establish the basics. It should be the same thing that you're doing when you get a new piece anyway. What's the time signature? I've got this in the key signature. Where is Doe going to be? Things that we should look out for. We then have silent time. And the silent time is, I think, one of the most important times. It is an opportunity for the students to work on phonating, um, work on listening inside their heads and trying to figure it on their own. We all know that you have leaders that are gonna know how to do it right away. And you have students that may take a little longer. And if you jump immediately to students singing out loud, your students who are maybe not as strong of a sight readers do not have the opportunity to work on that internal phonation. So take some silent time then have students sing it to themselves. And this can be a scary one to get students to do if they're scared about singing alone. And we talk about all the time how it's gonna just sound like chaos. I tried to record you our uh, sight reading process in, um, in, in COVID land. And I'll tell you with the students sitting six feet apart in a gym in masks, you couldn't hear a lot of the, the silent time and the singing to yourself. Um, so I'm sorry, you just have to listen to me explain it to you, but just know this is what we do. Um, so silent time, sing it to yourself. And we talk about just sing it out loud, just sing it out loud. Um, and the students can then kind of jump off each other like, oh man, I'm having a hard time with this interval. And I'm like, oh man, Katie just sang it. I heard it, I know it, okay, I got it and I can fix it. Then work on neighboring. And neighboring is so important because it gives them an opportunity to check what it is that they're doing. Um, one of the things I absolutely love about the way MSVMA allows sight reading in the festival process, because it's exactly how that's gonna run in your classroom, have them work with other parts. Um, the new rules allow you to have four students in a group if it is a different person on each part. So my SATB ensembles, once they are ready, are able to say like, hey, my name is Jessica, I'm ready to go. And I can say, okay, cool, I'm a soprano, there's an alto, there's a tenor, there's a bass, and they have an opportunity to practice that together. And it helps, it helps with the tuning. Sometimes chords can sound really awesome, but your jump is weird. And if you know where you have to land within that chord, it'll help. Here's our routine. Again, establish the basics, quiet time, sing it by yourself, sing it with your neighbors. And if your ensemble is able, sing it with other people. My big thing that I want you to take away from this is just make it work. Find something that works for you and use it. Use it consistently, use it regularly, use it as a skill, not as a chore. Make it applicable. Why do we do this? I am teaching you to sight read because I want you to be a better musician. I am teaching you to sight read because I want you to be able to read music faster. I want a rehearsal process to get to the music making and not the part playing. Make it applicable. Ownership, real world application. Pride of ownership. Students, as I said, are so proud of themselves when they are able to say, wow, I did this. I did this. My accompanist didn't play my part. My teacher didn't play my part. I did this. I hope there's something that you can take away. This is not the only way to do it. This is what I have done and what is successful for me. 
If you have any questions, if you have anything you want to share with me or want me to walk through you again, I'm happy to field any questions or send you any videos or, or help you develop a process of your own. Um, my email is located at the bottom there. It's newcoop at owasso.k12.mi.us. And I hope it was useful. Have a great day, guys.